yards away of pulling you to your peace of mind every day. Welcome to the Backpacking Light Podcast. I'm Andrew Marshall. And I'm Ryan Jordan. And today's podcast is a skills short where we spend 15 or 20 minutes giving you practical, solid, actionable advice to improve your life in the backcountry. Today's topic is managing moisture in layering systems. This is somewhat related to a lot of the layering content we've been making lately, including a few podcasts about layering systems, and we'll put links to those in the show notes, and some major articles about layering, wicking, and so forth. So Ryan, I guess I I wanted to start out with what is it about this topic that has just really captured your attention right now? If you look at layering as a, as a really basic skill, we're taught that primarily that we're looking at a three layer system. We have a base layer, which is designed to wick. I'm going to put that in air quotes because we're going to talk about wicking. You have this insulating layer that may or may not be worn while hiking. And then you have this shell layer, which may or may not be worn by hiking, depending on if there's wind and rain. So the combination of these three layers in theory should address all of the conditions you face in the backcountry. Now, the the lightweight backpacking community has gravitated more towards a four layer system for most conditions, which includes a base layer, a very light insulation layer. It may even be a second base layer and a shell layer, waterproof breathable shell layer. And these three layers are designed to handle most of what you experience in inclement conditions in the summer or maybe the the start of the early or late fringe seasons. And then you have this puffy layer that you wear in camp or maybe while sleeping. And that puffy layer could be high loft insulating down or synthetic fiber fill. So very simple idea that you assemble a multi-layer system and you adjust the layers according to the conditions. But the reality is the the physiological processes and the physical processes that that move moisture and heat through a layer layering system are incredibly complex. And trying to create formulas to uh, predict what's going to happen is nearly impossible. And so we're left to um, sense what's going on in real time in the field. And then the goal of what information and education we're providing right now is to help you understand what each type of layer does and does not do. And hopefully you can use that information to uh, pay attention to your comfort level and optimize the performance of your layers so they don't get soaking wet. Okay. So in this podcast specifically, we're talking about managing moisture. So let's start with base layers. And that means we have to start by addressing um, wicking. And this is this is really fascinating to me, especially in the last couple of weeks, as we've started to look at um, if wicking is, is something you even necessarily want happening or not. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So there's, there's two ways to get water out of your body when you're exercising. The first way is water naturally evaporates from your skin. And as you exercise, you produce heat and more moisture vapor evaporates from your skin surface. And that is a mechanism by which heat and moisture leaves your body. And so that water vapor can pass all the way through your clothing. And if it's warm out, it will leave your clothing as water vapor. If it's cold out, that water vapor will reach a condensation temperature at some point in the layering system and then become water. Now you've got water in your clothing system that's somewhere outside your skin surface, but inside your clothing. And then to get that water out, you're primarily sapping heat from your body to drive evaporation. Okay. So that's one mechanism by which water gets out of your body. Second mechanism is what happens to perspiration? So perspiration is the, the formation of liquid water on your skin surface. You're sweating. The dominant idea behind getting sweat off your skin is to use a fabric that so-called wicks as your base layer that's in contact with your skin so that when that water droplet contacts the base layer fabric, the base layer fabric sucks it up and spreads it out, disperses it through the fabric, 
and then it can evaporate into the rest of your clothing system, or maybe it wicks out into the next layer. Now, wicking as a mechanism is a little bit complex. It, mm -hmm. There's actually two sub mechanisms that promote wicking. One is you've got the, the water molecules sitting on a fiber surface and they can actually travel along that fiber surface because of the difference in electrical charge between the water molecule and the fiber surface. The second mechanism is capillary action by which you've got this fabric that has a dense knit structure and it creates these little tiny capillaries across the thickness of the fabric. And as water fills up in those capillaries, they, the capillaries, capillary action, the force of capillary action draws water away. Okay. So we got two processes that can happen there. So wicking is the physical movement of water through a porous fabric structure. So, um, when we talk about base layers, uh, I can think of a lot of base layers that sort of promote themselves as, as wicking fabrics. And, um, I guess one thing I'd like to ask you is, are there situations where you don't necessarily want that to happen? I am not a fan of wicking fabrics in very cold temperatures. And I'll tell you why. Um, if you take a perfectly wicking base layer fabric, it's one that's skin tight, which I find incredibly uncomfortable anyways. So there's a comfort level there. There's subjective comfort that people experience that has to go into your layering system design. It's not just fiber performance, but let's say we're wearing a skin tight base layer. That's perfectly wicking. The, the fabric is hydrophobic. It is densely knit. So there's all these capillaries that can draw moisture away from your skin. And the moment you sweat, which you will, if you're working hard, especially in this season, in the winter season, then that sweat is going to hit that fabric surface. It's going to disperse rapidly throughout the fabric. So now we've taken this big water droplet, we've dispersed it throughout the entire fabric. And now we have all these water molecules that are in liquid form spread out high, very high surface area. So that then drives evaporation. Evaporation is the process by which you're using heat from your body to evaporate that liquid water. And then it drives out of your clothing system via vapor, but evaporation saps an enormous amount of heat from your body. You can experience this effect by working really hard, climbing a hill with a big pack, wearing one of these wicking layers, getting to the top of the hill, resting a little bit. And all of a sudden the excess body heat that you're no longer generate, you're, you're not generating any more body heat by hiking. So now all of your excess body heat drives evaporation and you experience this chilling effect that we call the flash off effect. And it's incredibly uncomfortable. And to, to address that, you have to immediately put on a very thick puffy layer to slow that process down. So you, you can keep your body heat in your, in your system. If you use a less wicking fiber, something more hydrophobic and you have a better ventilated clothing system and you regulate your output level. So you're not sweating as much. I think you have the potential to create an environment that's far more comfortable than just wearing a hydropho hydrophilic wicking layer next to your skin. Yeah. And we've talked about some of those components in the podcast before we've talked about the importance of manual ventilation and rain jackets. Um, I don't know that we've talked a lot about actually managing output. Um, so that might be worth delving into just slightly here. Can you talk about some strategies to sort of manage how hard you're working, maybe especially as you're climbing? This is, this is most difficult for people who are in really good shape. If you're, if you're not in good shape, you, your, your aerobic capacity is going to manage the output for you. And you, you'll be limited by your aerobic capacity and you're not necessarily going to sweat a whole lot. You're just going to be fatigued climbing a big hill. But if you have a level of aerobic fitness that allows you to maintain at or below your aerobic capacity, but still output a lot of energy and heat, you're going to sweat. And so for, for, uh, for, for you guys, it's really going to depend on you slowing down a little bit to, and it's going to be in response to your clothing system and the outside temperature, how much wind is blowing, how steep the hill is, how heavy of a pack you're carrying. But if you can regulate that, 
and minimize the amount you are perspi perspiring, you'll you'll achieve far more comfort in your clothing system. You'll dump less moisture into it. And it does require that you pay attention to how many layers you're wearing on the outside. So if you're one of these guys that can really uh, crank it up going up a steep hill, you may consider shedding a layer at the bottom of that hill so that you don't trap so much heat inside your layering system that you are going to um, uh, perspire a lot. Now, in the winter, especially when you've got wind or snow and you have to wear a shell layer like shell layers hijack the whole thing they, mm -hmm. they just they trap so much heat and really the only way you can address that there's there's choose something that's more breathable has a high mvtr moisture vapor transmission rate or you choose something that has lots of ventilation options pit zips chest zip uh, pocket zips whatever you have at your hand so that you can make sure those vents are all open while you're exerting hard. You and I were working on a piece that we've recently published um, by one of our authors, Stephen Sieber, and that piece was about synthetic base layers and their wicking properties. But in the course of editing it, we got into a discussion about natural fibers, wool, and sort of the, uh, the idea that wool is warm when wet and it, it, it was an interesting, um, you had an interesting explanation slash and or rebuttal for that. And I was wondering if, if there was a way for you to uh, condense it for our listeners. You bet. A synthetic fiber is, it may be hollow, maybe a salt may have a solid core, but it's, it's generally a tubular or pseudo tubular fiber that is non-porous. So that means that water cannot pass through the fiber wall into the center of the fiber. So that means any water that adsorbs, AD, adsorbs onto the exterior of the fiber sits on the outside of that fiber. That fiber is woven into a fabric or knitted into a fabric that sits next, next to your skin. And if there is moisture on the outside of those fibers, you'll feel clammy and wet. Natural fibers like wool, they have a porous core or no, they have a porous fiber wall that leads to a core that can then absorb water, AB, absorb. So any water that exists on the outside of the fiber can then be absorbed into the fiber and the surface of the fiber stays drier so that when you're wearing wool for the same amount of water that's in a wool shirt, that's in a synthetic shirt, you're not going to feel as clammy. Now there's a point, it's called the saturation point at which um, a wool shirt will absorb so much water that the outside of the fibers are going to feel wet, just like a synthetic fiber, and then you're going to feel clammy. Now, the big difference between wool and synthetic is that wool has the capability of absorbing so much more water than a synthetic garment or synthetic fabric that you have a longer period of time before you wet out a wool shirt, so to speak, than if you wet out a synthetic shirt. So in trying to manage moisture in layering systems, um, I suppose we can continue using our, our winter high exertion um, model here. Uh, what is your kind of go-to system? If I am if I'm really trying to optimize everything for extreme conditions, I like two things. The, the fundamental layer that is my absolute favorite is a Brignier Merino wool fishnet short sleeve base layer. I don't need a long sleeve because we don't really sweat much on our forearms. Mm -hmm. So this is, a, this is a layer that has a Merino wool fiber component, uh, fiber structure, so that it feels dry even when it's loaded with a little bit of moisture. And there's big pores in it, which means a lot of the perspiration vapor that my body is emitting passes immediately into the next layer and doesn't sit on my skin for it to then disperse and evaporate and sap body heat. On top of that, I am comfortable wearing either a synthetic or a wool base layer. It can be wicking. It can be non-wicking. I don't really care. I just try to adjust it to the temperatures. Mm -hmm. I most commonly wear wool. 
But if I know I'm like mountaineering or carrying a heavy pack with you know, skis and deep backcountry snow, I might opt for a synthetic just because I appreciate the faster dry time of a synthetic. And then on top of that, I'll wear my shell layer. If, if I know that I'm in deep, serious cold, I'll replace that second layer with something more fleecy, like, um, a polar tech alpha hoodie or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other, uh, as we wrap up here, any other advice on managing moisture in a layering system? Yeah, go with comfort. It's going to take some experience. It'll take some time to dial in based on your hiking style and, and just how your body feels. But if I can give one piece of advice is do not believe that what a manufacturer tells you is comfortable or is performant is actually going to be comfortable or performant. So we one thing we discovered in Sieber's work is that a manufacturer will say that a fabric is wicking when it's not. Or they'll say that it's warm when wet when it's not. So nothing is really warm when wet. There's a sensation like for wool, but um, keep in mind, wool still has got some moisture absorbed in it that your body needs to uh, use heat to expel out of the clothing. So, you know, just be cognizant of what brands are telling you versus what you actually experience in the field. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of the Backpacking Light podcast. The Backpacking Light podcast is advertising free thanks to the membership fees paid by Backpacking Light members. A BackpackingLight.com membership gives you access to 20 years of archives, forums, and online courses. And don't forget, if you're an unlimited member, you'll get the video version of this podcast for free as a part of your membership. So please consider supporting this podcast and become a member right now at BackpackingLight.com slash membership. You can download the show notes for this episode at backpackinglight.com slash podcast. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review. It does help other people find the show. Thanks for listening to the Backpacking Light podcast. I'm Andrew Marshall. And I'm Ryan Jordan. And if we can leave you with one parting message, it's this. Pack less, be more, because lighter is better. Happy trails, everybody. So I shouldered my backpack, walk away from the car.